just a little more in the ears if you can find it. Thank you, Brian, for the blessing and privilege of being together again this year. How many were with us last year? Beautiful. Contour. 
tour of the ocean floor. So you might even see some surfers huddled around a certain patch of beach because it's the shape of the ocean floor in that particular location that causes the waves to crest. The largest waves in the world occur at a place called Nazare, Portugal. And the bigger than Hawaii's waves. And the reason this particular, and it's just in this one location, and the reason it produces the world's largest waves, two reasons, number one, you got these, these incredible blow you over kind of winds combined with in the ocean floor, there is this channel, you can't see it, but under the surface, a channel that the water flows down into the channel and then it hits a shelf right at the shore and the water has only one direction to go and there comes they, they, they call them monsters monsters that come out of the ocean monster waves and the world's biggest waves are happen in Nazare, Portugal because of the contour of the ocean floor. Surfing waves are caused by conditions below the surface that are unseen. I wonder if the underlying values that are the foundations of our worship ministries will determine whether we get any kind of waves in the spirit that are worth surfing. I've been thinking about it this week. Uh, Rita, I've been thinking about what kind of foundational values should be built into a worship ministry that would produce surfable waves? I just might work on a message like that sometime. I don't know. But I've got, I'm going to start it off with one idea. I think that if we put into the foundation of our worship ministry a value for singing all three song forms that Paul gave us in Colossians 3.16. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. If we had a value of incorporating all three into our corporate worship, would we find more waves of the Holy Spirit to serve? The Psalms, singing of Scripture, virtually non-existent in the global church of Jesus Christ. We do not sing Scripture in our churches. Hymns, 100% of what our churches do. Hymns. Spiritual songs. Well, there's a few churches that have a little bit of that. And then if you invite Rita in, you get a lot of that. <clears throat> Spontaneous phrases of love in the moment. Spiritual songs. Hymns are songs of human composition. And I think that if we will have values built into the foundations of our worship ministries, then we just might get more waves to serve in the Holy Spirit. A definition of spontaneous worship I shared it last year. I'm going to share it again now. It's good enough that you want to get your camera out and take a pic of the screen when they put it up here. Spontaneous worship is the freedom to move seamlessly between psalms, hymns, and spirits. 
spiritual songs. Psalms, hymns, psalm, spiritual song, hymn, spiritual song, hymn, psalm, spiritual song, hymn. The freedom to move seamlessly between psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going after the surfing thing because, and I like to be with Brian because he's a surfer. So I'm with some friends here this week. Great to have Lamar and Kimberly with us. Thank you, Lamar, for coming. Love it. I'm not going to talk about surfing tonight. I've got something else on my heart. invite you to pray with me. I've been carrying something that it just feels a little bit unusual. And I just, I don't even know how to deliver what is in my heart tonight. So I'm just going to ask for help and I invite you to pray with me. Pray for me. Let's pray for one another. Let's ask for help now. Holy Spirit, we need help. I'm needing help. My friend next to me is needing help. Just pray for the one on your right, the one on your left. Pray for your own heart. Pray for me. Lord Jesus, we're asking for grace to be with us in the preaching, in the speaking, in the hearing. Without you, we can do nothing. And I'm just saying, Lord, I'm just saying in the presence of all my friends, I am bankrupt right now, and I need you desperately. Holy Spirit, come. going to talk tonight about Philistine carts. Our passage is 1 Samuel chapter 4. We're going to start there. I'm not going to read it. just going to tell you about the story a little bit. Israel was defeated by the Philistines and, uh, and so the elders got together and they said, what are we going to do? And somebody had an idea. They said, Let's get the ark and bring it to the battleground because they remember Jericho. God had told them at Jericho, bring the ark to the battle, and God fought for them. And so they said they were actually treating the ark almost like it had magical properties, like a lucky charm. And so they brought the ark to the battle. God was not directing this. This was their own conceived notion. They brought the ark to the battle. It ended up being presumptuous. When the ark came into the camp, the people of Israel lifted a shout of victory that shook the earth. The Philistines heard the shout, and the word goes out, God just came into the camp of Israel. And the Philistines look at one another and go, we're in trouble. You better fight like a man, bro, because God just came into the camp. And the Philistines rose up and went crazy. And they slaughtered the people of Israel, and the ark of God was captured. 
It's one of the lowest moments in the history of Israel when the Ark of God was captured. It was in the land of Philistia for seven months. And for seven months, the, the Philistines were ravaged by cancerous tumors and they were dying hundreds, thousands of Philistines were dying because they had the ark in the wrong place. They weren't prepared to have the presence of God in their midst and it was actually detrimental and fatal to them. And so they said, we have got to get rid of this thing. And they said, okay, let's test it out now. They built a new, a new cart and they put the ark on a new cart, attached it with two, the Bible calls them milk cows. In other words, they had young calves at home and these two calves against their will, lowing the whole way, they bring the Ark of the Covenant back to the land of Israel. The people of Israel take the cart, uh, take the Ark, and take it to Abinadab's house. It's in Abinadab's house for roughly 40 years. 40 years later, David becomes king, and one of the first things he's going to do after he takes the stronghold of Zion, he wants to move the ark and set up a tent for it in Zion. So 2 Samuel chapter 6 is where we commence our reading in the story. 2 Samuel 6 verse 3. So they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the hill of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. And when they came to Nachon's threshing floor, Asa put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there by the ark of God. Something that I like to practice in when I'm reading the scripture I will put myself right into the story and place myself at the scene. So as we consider this scene tonight together, keep in mind we have a corpse at our feet. There's our context. The ark was the place of God's presence. It represented Israel's worship. And God was particular about how the ark was to be transported. Now on some things, God is willing for us to be creative and innovative. But when it comes to worship, there are some things that he's particular about. He has said, when it comes to worship, I want you to do it this way. How many in the room know we don't worship God my way? We worship his way. 
he's expressed, this is how I want you to worship. And he said, this is how I want you to move my presence. It's important to me how you do this. When it comes to worship, he never asked for innovation. He asked for obedience and righteousness. Now, the first time around, David didn't consult God on the proper order. The Philistine method, after, after all, seemed to work pretty well. It was expedient, it was efficient, it was effective. And we may be as sincere as David was, but sincerity without obedience becomes presumption. The Levites in our story represent the ministry of worship today. They were doing back then what we do today. Today, worship ministries move the presence of God in worship. We take God's people on a journey. We start here, and we're headed for there. Our destination is the heart of God. Our destination is Zion. We want to appear before God in Zion. And Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, he said, I'm in the midst. So we gather together. Jesus joins us. And then worship ministries in a Levitical capacity begin to move the room toward the heart of God. And we're making a spiritual pilgrimage together. So if worship ministries today are doing what the Levites did back then, is there something that we can learn from this story. I'm going to be asking a bunch of questions tonight. I really don't have very many answers at all. I've got more questions tonight than I have answers, but may the Lord help us to engage with what I think can be some significant questions tonight. Let me start with this. Why did David put the ark on a cart? Well, it seems obvious, because that's how the Philistines did it. The cart was a Philistine invention, and God seemed to honor it. I mean, you remember, the two milk cows brought the, brought the ark back to the nation of Israel. God seemed to bless that occasion, and uh, it obviously worked. And so David's like, well, it worked. Then let's do it again. And so they built a, car, a cart just like the Philistines did and moved the ark on a Philistine cart. And the whole thing went bad. We just read about it. Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark, and he is struck by God for his error. What was Uzzah's error? Error. Well, Numbers 4.15. God had told the Levites in Numbers 4.15, he said, when you move the ark, I want you to move it with poles. They put poles through the rings, and they carried the ark on poles. So, and the Lord said in Numbers 4.15, this way you won't have to touch the ark lest they die. Numbers 4.15, do not touch the ark lest you die. And so it was right there in the instruction manual. God had given them a way to move the ark without having to touch it by using poles. But David did not use poles. He used a cart. It seems that God held Uzzah responsible on this occasion because God killed Uzzah for his error. I can imagine Uzzah saying something like this, well, Lord, you know, 
I was really sincere. I was just trying to be helpful. And somehow that wasn't quite good enough for the Lord. I, I can almost imagine the Lord saying, you're a Levite. You should know. And God held us a responsible because he was a Levite and he should have known the instructions in the scriptures. David also should have known. It seems that David must not have read that verse or something yeah, because David should have known about this, but he didn't consult the scripture. He didn't do due diligence. And so we have this incident where putting it on a cart. If we are meant to learn from this story, if this story has any relevance to worship ministries today, let me ask this question. Is it also a temptation for us to use Philistine cards? Moving the room the way the Philistines do. Now, what does a Philistine cart represent? Well, I'm going to give you my personal interpretation. You can test it and see if it works for you. Next screen. The Philistine cart for me represents human mechanisms to move. God's presence forward in corporate worship. I'm not saying evil mechanisms. I'm saying human mechanisms to move the presence of God forward in worship. Using natural strengths to accomplish a spiritual purpose. We've got the right goal, but the wrong methodology. Galatians 3.3, 3, Paul said, Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Are we getting our methodology of worship from YouTube or are we getting it from God's Word? Maybe you've gone to YouTube. Maybe you've watched some Philistine tutorials on cart mobilization. The worship carts on YouTube are pretty impressive. They're efficient. They're expedient. They're attractive, they're contemporary, they're reproducible. I'm going to share some benefits of Philistine cards. Benefits of Philistine cards. Now, if you pick up a little bit of tongue in cheek while I talk about this, you will be having some good discernment. If you pick up a little bit of sarcasm, I'm going to do a little stretch of sarcasm tonight, and it's intentional. If somebody goes, well, I don't like it when the preacher is sarcastic. Did you know that sometimes in the Bible, God is sarcastic? There's a time, actually, for some holy sarcasm, and I'm going to try to stay holy with it, Pastor Steve, but we're going to be a little bit sarcastic to make a point. Uh, and so I'm just saying that to say you have permission to smile. You have permission to laugh if you want to, okay, because the sarcasm is intentional. Benefits of Philistine cards. Here we go. Number one, carts go further faster. Love this one. 
when you've got a car with wheels, you can gain some sweet momentum. Oh. Three times in our text, we are told that Abinadab's house was on a hill. We are meant to visualize a downhill run. We've got a cart. We've got wheels. It's being pulled by two oxen. It's being driven by two Levites. Now the Levites aren't driving this like a car. They're driving it like they're driving the oxen. And, uh, but it's on a downhill slope and you're meant to envision a scene where the cart is going faster and faster and faster and it's gaining a head of steam going downhill and the oxen they're pulling the cart and then the cart is pushing them and the thing is gaining great momentum until the oxen can't quite keep up with the pace and they stumble. Uzzah puts out his hand to steady the ark because the ark goes like this and he is struck for his error. Levites love momentum. I'm talking as a Levite. I love momentum and so do you. We love crowd energy. We love crowd enthusiasm. We love the excitement in contrast to that shoulder thing. When the Levites carry it on their shoulder, it just, uh, it just seems to take forever to get anywhere when they're carrying that thing on their shoulder. Number two, a good cart can help reduce the length of your worship services. Because when you get up a good head of steam and you start moving faster, when you move faster, you get to your destination faster. And that means a shorter worship service. Hashtag sweet. When you have momentum on a cart, you can take that 30-minute worship service and chisel it back to 20. Once you've got your worship service down to 20 minutes, I bet you anything, you can prune that baby back to 17 and deliver in 17 minutes the same punch that you delivered in 20. And by the time you get the service back to 17 minutes, it's really not that difficult to pare it down and fit it inside 15. Everybody loves shorter meetings. I love shorter meetings. You love shorter meetings. Worship team love, we love shorter meetings. Pastors love shorter meetings. People love shorter meetings. Nursery workers love shorter meetings. Ushers love shorter meetings. Visitors love shorter meetings. Shorter worship services, a fantastic benefit of Philistine carts. Number three, carts are smoother. It's always smoother riding instead of walking. Are there any golfers in the room? It's always smoother riding <laughs> instead of walking. Carts are smooth. Carts give worshipers a much smoother worship experience. 
awesome. <laughs> Number four benefit of Philistine carts. Carts require less manpower. A Philistine cart only needs two Levites. If you're going to carry that thing on poles on your shoulders, you got to have four Levites. That's double the staff, double the salaries, do the profit loss sheet bro, it makes business sense to use a good Philistine cart. And number five benefit, I'm still being sarcastic, number five benefit of Philistine carts, they aren't so exhausting because you learn to let the wheels do all the work for you. Walking that thing with poles on your shoulder. Man, that thing is exhausting. You feel it in your feet. It wears your feet out. It gets you right here. That's where the cramps set in. It'll get you right in the bottom of your back right there. And it really gets your shoulder. And I'll tell you where it really gets you is right in your neck. Right there. And it comes out on your forehead, and you start to sweat. It's exhausting. By the time you do it for a while, you need to be relieved. And now, four Levites becomes eight Levites, and one worship team becomes two worship teams. And the whole thing is just exhausting. Now, everybody seemed to be, to be very happy with the cart. The people were happy with the cart. The Levites were happy with the cart. David was happy with the cart. Everybody loved the Philistine cart, except for one person. The one for whom the whole thing was intended. The cart was smooth to the Philistines and rough to God. And what was rough to the Levites was smooth to God. There's lots of worship carts on YouTube today. Now when I say worship carts, I'm talking about models of corporate worship. There are models of corporate worship to be found on YouTube today. There's some really cool carts on YouTube. I mean, they are, they look cool, they ride cool, they're awesome. If you go to YouTube, you can check out the England cart. You can find the Brazil cart. You can find the Australia cart. You can check out the California cart. You can do the Kansas City cart. That's where I come from. You can do the North Carolina cart. You can check out the Nashville cart. You can look at the Atlanta cart. And we have some awesome carts today on YouTube. YouTube is providing us with so many fantastic cart options. And we have so many accessories and tools available today. And I'm still being sarcastic. We have so many accessories and tools available today in worship. We've got strobe lights, floodlights, moving head spotlights, climate control, sound loops, multi-tracks, click tracks, pads, talk back microphones, auto-tune software, synthetic sounds, electronic tuners, 
pedal boards, electronic drum kits, avion, subwoofers, cameras, high definition jumbotron screens, reverb, compression, equalizers, smoke machines, not to mention flags and banners and streamers. We've got so many aids and implements, it's easier today more than ever to lead smooth worship services that go further faster. Okay, now the sarcasm is finished. Now I'm going to talk from my heart. God wanted the Levites to carry the ark on their shoulders because shoulders represent responsibility. And God wants us to feel the weight and the burden of the responsibility we have in leading God's people in worship. The rallying call is not, let's go out there and have fun. Okay, I just said it. The rallying call is, let's tremble under the burden of the responsibility that we have to steward the presence of God. We have accepted the holy responsibility of helping people connect with God and how we steward the moment can make an eternal difference in the lives of people that are in the room. They are making eternal decisions in the presence of God and how we steward this moment has eternal implications in the lives of the people that are in the room with us. Carrying the presence with poles is hard work. Listen, leading worship is hard work. I should have gotten some real good amens on that one. I've got a bunch of worship leaders in the room tonight. I'm going to try this one more time, and I want the worship leaders to talk to me. Worship leading is hard work. It'll make you sweat. It's burdensome. And when we understand the sobriety of what we have been entrusted with, it'll make us tremble in the presence of God. When carrying the ark, the Levites had to watch with their eyes, balance with their hands, and feel with their feet. Reminds me of serving. This is what servers do. They watch with their eyes, they balance with their hands, and they feel with their feet. This is what worship ministries do. We're watching with our eyes to see what God is doing. We're balancing with our hands, and we're feeling with our feet. One, one surfer, on a, I was watching a documentary this week on surfing. Surfer goes, surfing is spiritual. The surfers that go after the big waves, they call it dancing with God. I 
I'm going to say something right now that I don't understand. And if you want to know what it means, you have to talk to Rita Springer because she's the one to tell you what it means. Here it comes. We lead worship with our feet. The Levites were watching with their eyes, balancing with their hands, and feeling with their feet. What does it mean to lead worship with your feet? We're on a journey with God. We're starting at point A. We're aiming for point B. We're wanting to go to Zion together. And we're shepherds. We're pastors. And we're taking people on a journey, going together into the heart of God. And we're feeling the ground every step of the way with our feet. I'm going to be talking a little bit about our feet tonight, so just listen for it, because we lead worship with our feet. I have a question. Rita's probably got the answer. Here's my question. What does it mean to take six paces and then stop? What does that mean for worship? I've been asking this question, Lamar, for a few weeks now. I'm after this. What does it mean to take six paces and stop? Our scripture is the second time that the, that the ark was moved, 2 Samuel 6.13. David did this one the correct way. The Levites carried it on their shoulders, 2 Samuel 6.13. And so it was when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces that they sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. What does it mean to take six paces and stop? Six paces and stop. Six paces and stop. It's the opposite of a cart with wheels. For us, it seems herky-jerky. For us, it seems stop and go. And for God, he calls it smooth. For us, it's the opposite of momentum. But I want to point something out. The cart with wheels never got to its destination. And six paces and stop, and they got to Zion. Six paces, and then they stop. The things that get us to Zion are sometimes counterintuitive. When we take six steps and then pause, we're making room for the Holy Spirit. You have to make room for glory. I'm thinking right now of the time when Jesus comes to the house. He's about to raise the young girl from the dead, but the house is full of mourners, professional mourners, professional flutists, and they've got this whole commotion going. And Jesus says, make room. Because if you're going to have resurrection, you have to make room for resurrection. Get the unbelief out. Get the commotion out. Get the distractions out. Get the skeptics out so that we can have us a resurrection service. Make room for resurrection. Make room for faith. Make room for glory. And if we're going to have glory, you've got to make room for glory. Take six paces and stop. You're making room for glory. 
I want you to think right for a moment with me about everything that worship leaders are attempting to accomplish in their ministry. I'm just going to go through the list of it, and by the time I'm finished, you're going to you're going to be a little bit impressed at what worship leaders do because it's really pretty incredible. All the things that worship leaders are attempting. Number one, we're trying to follow the chords, get the chords right. Number two, we're trying to follow the melody. Let's get that melody line correct. Number three, the voice sings of the instrument. Then the inversions on the instruments. Then we're trying to stay connected to the lyrics. You want to get the lyrics right. And then we're trying to pay attention to the syncopation and to the rhythms. And then we're trying to control our voice because you want to keep your voice on pitch and you're trying to control your vibrato so that it's nice and then we're trying to maintain team cohesiveness on the platform because you want your team to stay together and so you've got the talk back microphone and you're getting eye contact and you're you know you're smiling and engaging with one another and melting a few instructions and, and you're building team cohesiveness cohesiveness on the platform, plus you're managing congregational engagement. Are the people watching or are the people worshiping? Are they engaged? Are they disengaged? What do we need to get them engaged right now? Do I need to bring an exhortation? Do I need to read a scripture? Do I need to yell at them? What do we need to do right now to get the people engaged? Then we're trying to balance psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and we're also trying to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And as though all of that isn't enough, we're wanting to engage with Jesus for ourselves because we're not a hireling. We are actually a true shepherd. We love him. We're doing it because we're doing it because it's for you. When we do this, Jesus, it has to be from a broken heart. It has to be oil and fragrance from a heart that is given to you. It's got to be spirit. It's got to be soul. It's got to be mine. It's got to be all my heart. I've got to put everything on the altar. I've got to give you everything that I am because it's personal for me. If you're a hireling, you're happy when everybody else worships, but you're not a hireling. It's not good enough for you that everybody else is worshiping. You've got to have something in your own heart. You've got to have a fire in your own spirit. And so in addition to managing them, managing them, managing the music, you've got to have a heart that's engaging. It has to be eye to eye, face to face, heart to heart. How are you going to do all that? If you put all that on a cart, you're going to roll right past the Holy Spirit. The only way I know to do it. Six paces and stop. We've got to slow down. There are some places in worship you can only get to one step at a time. Watching with your eyes, balancing with your hands, and feeling with your feet. Sometimes we have to slow down to catch up with Jesus. If you want a worship concert, get yourself a good cart. If you want a song service, get yourself a good cart. If you want to work your way through a set list, Get yourself a good card. But if 
of you want worship? From the heart, rending of the heart, fragrance at his feet, eye to eye. Take six steps and stop. If you want to dance with the creator, look at how he created the earth. He took six paces and then stopped. Here's what's happening on Instagram today. You know this. Everybody's posting their highlights. We see the show reels of their lives, and now we compare our boring lives with the excitement of all their show reels, and we want our lives to look like their show reels. And it's not real. And the same thing is happening on YouTube when it comes to worship. We have world-class worship ministries posting their show reels on YouTube. We watch their car roll along on YouTube. There's momentum. There's impact. There's power. And now we want our church to reproduce the show reels of those worship leaders and and I'm here to tell you, it's not real. It's the show reels of their hottest moments, and it's not real. I'll tell you what is real. Take six steps and stop. That's what all our churches are doing. You're not the only one. This is where reality is. In the Holy Spirit, we don't know how to get to Zion. We don't know how to do this, Lord. But we're going to take six steps. We're going to stop, and we're going to talk to you, and we're going to engage with you, and we're going to say it's for you. It's personal. It's because we love you. It's because our eyes are on you. And Jesus, we're coming after you, and we just got to stop again because we don't know our way forward without you. YouTube playlists have become the global model for corporate worship around the world. Pastor Steve, I'm out here. I'm on this thing far enough. I may as well just talk about it. The whole world. My friends, this is not just Colorado. This is not just America. It is around the world. YouTube playlists have become the model for worship in the church around the world Worldwide, we are singing YouTube playlists in our churches. And it's actually not real. Now, understand, I, I actually like YouTube. I actually like YouTube worship. I love YouTube, actually. But it is not our model for corporate worship. Okay, so the altar call starts now. I'm going to be preparing an altar here tonight. And over the next few moments, anytime that you want to come up and express an altar to the Lord, you're welcome to do that. Because I'm now inviting us to the altar. What did they do with the Philistine cart? I didn't get this to the media team. Would you find for me, please? 1 Samuel 6, 14. 1 Samuel 6, 14. Give us a moment. They're going to look it up and try to get it on the screen for us. Here's what they did with the Philistine cart. 1 Samuel 6.14. I'm catching them off guard because I didn't send this verse to them. Then the guard came into 
the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh, Beth Shemesh, and stood there. A large stone was there. So they split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. They split the wood of the cart. The word split there means to break apart. In Second Chronicles 25, it means to dash in pieces. In Genesis 22, verse 3, it's the same word where Abraham split the wood so that he could offer his son as an offering to the Lord. They took axes to the Philistine cart and they violently broke it apart and with axes chopped it into burnable pieces and then they offered the cows as a sacrifice on the Philistine cart. And I'm wondering if God is asking anybody in the room to get violent tonight. Is the Holy Spirit inviting anyone in the room to take an axe to a cart and chop it up, consecrate their hearts to the Lord, and say, Lord, this cart that I've been involved in, by the grace of God, as you're calling me to it, I'm going to exercise spiritual violence. If there's anyone responding to that, you're welcome to start coming up right now and give your heart to the Lord. I've been talking about feet tonight, and I wonder if there's anybody here that wants to consecrate their feet to the Lord tonight. If you see somebody coming up here tonight that's got their shoes off, it's because they're consecrating their feet to the Lord, because there's something about our feet. We're watching with our hands. We're, we're, we're watching with our eyes. We're balancing with our hands. And we're feeling with our feet how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those that bring good news. And God's calling somebody tonight. You, you, you're like, I want to dance with God. Well, then why don't you consecrate your feet in holiness to the Lord tonight? Because you're not a driver of the presence of God. You're a carrier of the presence of God. You've got the presence on your shoulders. You've been called of the Holy Holy Spirit to carry his presence everywhere that you go and every step of your feet is consecrated to Jesus. You're a carrier of the presence of God. You're welcome to come at any time. This is an altar call. It's going to take about 15 minutes for this altar call. So just bear with us because we're going to be responding to the Lord. <clears throat> While, and stay right here. But I want to talk about, for a few moments, watch for altars that God honors. When God puts fire on an altar, pay attention. There's something to learn. I'm going to tell three stories about this. Number one story, David, he brought the ark to Zion, but then he blew it. And God sent a destroying angel who was moving through the nation, destroyed 70,000 Israelites, and then God said to the angel, stop right there. And where that angel stopped, God said, David, I want you to build an altar 
right here where the angel stopped. David builds an altar of worship and fire falls from heaven and consumes the sacrifice. And David goes, I've never seen fire fall on an altar. God, what are you trying to say? Good question to ask. When fire comes on an altar, you want to ask God, what are you saying? What God was saying with that altar was, this is the very spot where I want you to erect Solomon's tabernacle. I want the sacrifices to happen right here. And he put fire on the altar to highlight his message to David. Number two story I want to tell you. This goes back a few years. I was invited to a city in America by a friend. My friend's name is Ron. And Ron is pulling together on a Saturday. He's pulling together a worship forum. And he's calling all the worship ministries of this city together. Now, in this particular city, my friend Ron is well connected. He knows kind of the who's who of all the churches in town. And he decides for this Saturday forum, he's going to pull together a worship team from all the churches. And he gets the best of the best. So the bass guitars from this church and the and, and the keyboarders from this church and the drummers from this church and, and the singers, he's got the best. He he hand he cherry picks the best of the best in the city and pulls them together to be the worship team for this Saturday morning worship forum. And then he contacted me. He said, Bob, would you be willing to come out and share with us on this Saturday morning? And I'm like, sure, I'll come. So I had to pull in Friday night because this is a Saturday morning event. 9 a.m. it starts. So I come in Friday afternoon. I get to the church, and the worship team is, is together, and Ron has said to them, you can do anything except practice. He said, you can tune your instrument, you can arrange your music, you can have pizza, you can pray for one another, you can fellowship, you can do anything you want to do except practice. Well, this team has never been together before. They're cherry-picked from all the churches in town. They've never functioned as a team before. And Ron will not let them practice. Well, that was okay until the worship leader took sick. And leading worship for the day fell to the backup worship leader. Now, the backup worship leader... She's a sweetheart. She's a personal friend of mine. I love her dearly. And she gets stuck leading worship for this worship forum on a Saturday morning. And I didn't realize it, but she's not so happy. It's about 15 minutes before the event starts, about quarter to nine in the morning. And I happened to be walking down a corridor of the building, and as I'm moving down the corridor, the worship leader has taken her husband aside into one of the side rooms, and she is letting him have it. She, because he is best friends with Ron, and she is saying to her husband, you have got to talk to Ron driving me crazy. There's no vision. There's no purpose. I don't know where we're going. He won't let us practice. And she, because she is now going to be the face of this mess, and she's going to be standing in front of all the worship ministries in the city, and Ron won't let them practice. And she is not happy. And I'm like, whoa. So when the service begins, about 15, 20 minutes later, I'm standing on the front row, and the worship team comes out on the platform, and they take their microphones, and they're all smiling, and she's smiling, and I have insider information. I happen to know that not everything is happy on the platform. 
And I'm standing there like, what is going to happen today? I give you my testimony with the first line of the first song. Jesus walked in the room. The presence of God fell in the house. Jesus was with us. All the apprehension on the platform melted instantly. It was going to be easy. Jesus walked in the room. It was stunning. And I'm like, why did God put fire on that altar? I don't know, but I'll give you my theory. The refusal to lean on the strength of human gifts, talents, abilities, natural strengths. And God looked at that altar and says, I like this altar. Fire. Third story. I'm finished. This story goes back to a year ago today. We convened at a conference here. Unveil worship conference. I'm going to tell an unveiled story. Brian contacts me. Now, if you can remember what it was like in May of 2021. I don't know if you can think back that far. But when Brian contacted me, nobody was doing conferences. I mean, it was, you know, you talk about politically correct or whatever. Nobody was doing this. And Brian says, he says, my pastor and I, we've been in prayer. And I think in January of that year, they were like, you know, I think God's putting it in our heart. We're going to call a worship conference. And Brian contacts me, says, would you want to come? And I'm like, bro, <laughs> that is bold. <laughs> yes, I'm coming. <laughs> so we gathered last year. Right around this time, there was about as many in the room as there are again this year. And it was sweet because none of us had done anything for two years. None of us had been at a conference for, it, I'd been two years since I've been at a worship conference. And I, we were all like kids in a candy store. It was all just like, man, we're together and we're, we're worshiping Jesus. And we were just having a good time. We just loved that we were together. And so, and, and Jesus was honoring it. If you were here last year, you remember the presence of the Lord was sweet. Like, okay, look, like we've got a smile from heaven on this event and we're having a good time. It's, I think it might've been the second night I lost track was at the second or third night but Paul and Hannah McClure are leading worship and uh, now Paul and Hannah McClure are from Bethel Music in, uh, in, in uh, Reading and uh, Brian brought them to lead worship for this one night and Paul and Hannah are leading worship and they're doing Sarah McMillan's hymn uh, King of My Heart and they're singing the song you'll never let me down you'll never let me down you are good you are good and Paul was over here he was standing right about here and he had the guitar and he was leading you are good you are good King of My Heart you'll never let me down and Hannah his wife she was standing right about here and and in the middle of Sarah McMillan's, McMill McMillan's ham, Hannah starts to sing a psalm. I think the psalm police were not here. <laughs> because this psalm was not in Sarah McMillan's ham. But Hannah just starts to sing. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. She starts to sing Psalm 23. And then we went back to the hymn, You Are Good, You Are Good. And she's singing the hymn to the chords and the music of the, uh, uh, she's singing the psalm to the chords and music of the hymn. And then Paul and Hannah start to ping pong back and forth. 
They go from the song back to the hymn, back to the song, back to the hymn. And every time that, I've been telling this story all over the nation, by the way, Brian. Every time that Hannah would get on the psalm and sing, I'll, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Every time she got onto that thing, you could feel the water level just kind of like this. You know, there's some services that are ankle deep, that are some that are knee deep, some that are waist deep. We want swimming depth waters. I'm going to guess that we were somewhere around waist deep that night. It was good. We were having a good time. Jesus was in the house. We've got the, you know, we've, we, we've got the worship leader. I mean, it, it was sweet. Brian gets up and shut the whole thing down. He stopped the whole thing. He grabs the mic and he goes, if there's anyone in the room that has been diagnosed with a life-threatening condition, I invite you to come up and sing the psalm that Hannah's singing. I invite you to come and sing that psalm on my microphone. There was maybe 400 people in the room that evening, and I'm going to get, I didn't get a head count, but I'm going to guess maybe 20-ish people that came forward in that moment, and they were indicating by coming forward, they were indicating, I have a life-threatening illness, and they were willing to come and sing on the mic. So Brian takes his mic and gives it to the first woman that comes up here. I don't know if she's in the room tonight, and he gives it to her, and he says, sing the song. She won't sing the song. He goes, sing the song. And she's like, no. He says, sing Psalm 23. And she goes, I can't sing. And Brian will not let her alone. He is like, sing the song. He jams the microphone in the sister's mouth This gal starts to sing Psalm 23. When she started to sing that song, everybody in the room goes, you're right, you can't sing. <laughs> she was not flat. She was not sharp. She was on another planet. <laughs> it was not close to a song. It was a monotone, guttural incantation, basically speaking out on the microphone. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And I give you my testimony. I was here, and some of you were here a year ago. A wave of the Holy Spirit crashed into the room in that moment, and we for all of us instantly in swimming depth waters. Al McCausland, Al, my wave at us, Al, Al, he comes up to me afterwards and he says to me, in that moment, he says, I saw 600 angels rush into the room. I don't know if that's true, Al. I didn't see 600 angels, but I do know that we were all of us swimming in the glory of God. Pastor Steve, he was sitting right here. Pastor Steve, the way he talked about it, he said, a spirit of faith was released in the house. That's what happened. There was, a, there was an ignition of faith, and we were like, anything can happen in this moment because we made room for glory. Why did fire fall on that altar? Could it be because we took six steps and stopped? Consecrate your feet to the Lord. Give him your feet tonight. Six steps and then stop.
I believe the Lord wants to break some things off some Levites tonight. Rita, I'm going to ask if you'd come, please. And and uh, I'm, I, I want Jonathan, Jonathan on the drums. Worship team. Is Jonathan still here? Jonathan, get on their battle station, bro. <clears throat> I'm going to ask Rita, if you don't mind, just uh, waiting till I'm finished here, because just to help my voice, and uh, just to tell you the rules, because of my vocal condition, when I when the music starts, I'm knocked out. So I'm just going to share my heart, and then we're going to throw it to Rita, and we're going to, whatever God wants, we're going to take six steps. <clears throat> I'm asking God to break off the worship leaders of America a YouTube playlist model of worship. Jesus, would you break it off the churches of America? This is the altar call. You can come anytime you want to. Jesus, would you break off of your church a YouTube playlist model for songs on a cart? Lord Jesus, I'm asking you to break some worship cards in our hearts tonight. I don't know I don't know how to do this right now. I don't know how to talk about this. I don't know how to pray about this. I'm just asking the Lord to help us in this moment. Lord Jesus, would you just help us to connect the dots and make it personal for every person in this room. I'm asking God to break off of you competing with YouTube show reels. In Jesus' name, let it be broken off of us in Jesus name in the name of Jesus I want to break smooth off of you in the name of Jesus I am breaking the tyranny of smooth the burden of smooth it has to be smooth no it doesn't six steps and stop it's not smooth to us but it is smooth to God Lord Jesus would you break off of us the burden of smooth and while you're at it Lord break off of us the fear of men I need my stick Brian Brian I'm I'm, I'm gonna I'm Brian, I need that stick. Where's that stick? Well, it's behind me here, okay. I just saw an image. As I was preparing for tonight, I saw an image where in a prophetic act, I'm, I'm just going to try to be obedient here. This is totally whatever God wants to do with it. But in a prophetic act, I'm about to snap this stick over my knee. I'm going to break it. And as I break it, by the way, Jonathan, the moment that I break this stick, that's your moment, bro. I want you to hit that bass drum, and I want you to prophesy on those drums. So the moment I break this stick, bam. Got it? I'm going to prophesy. And then uh, Aaron, come on up here, bro. Rita, we don't care what you do. Just six steps. Uh, Aaron, I'm going to, when I'm finished here, I'm giving you my mic. Because Brian's got another mic, but you get this one. So you just stay right there with Rita. And, uh, and, and, whatever.
if you have faith. Now, you have to respond to something like this in faith. Because if you don't do it in faith, it's goofy. All right? I'm about to do something really goofy. But if you're in faith, God can actually honor it. So I'm about to break this stick prophetically over my knee in the name of Jesus. And when I do, I am asking God, by the grace of the Lord Jesus, in the power of the Spirit, to break some things off of your life. Now, you're the one to break the cart. You're the one to take an ax to that thing. But there are some things that God wants to break off some people in this room tonight. And if you're willing to receive it, when I break this thing, I'm just going to, I'm inviting you. You can sit, you can stand, you can, you can lift your hands, but I'm inviting you. Do something with your feet. Get your feet into this thing. Do something with your voice. Do something with your hands. Because we watch with our eyes. We balance with our hands. We feel with our feet. And I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going out on a limb right now, Lord Jesus. I'm believing that you are going to break some things off of some people in this room. In Jesus' name. <clears throat> So I'm just going to say it one more time. And by the way, when Jonathan starts on the drums, let's just go with him. Let's go with him, all right? Let's do this thing. Let's just, let's, let's let the Lord do whatever he wants to do. In the name of Jesus, I am breaking off of you a YouTube model of corporate worship, a YouTube playlist. We are declaring in the Holy Spirit that corporate worship is not a YouTube playlist, and we are not beholden to a YouTube playlist model of worship. And as I break this stick, may the Lord Jesus Jesus, break that off of you. I'm asking Jesus to break off of you any sense of competition with YouTube showreels. I'm asking Jesus to break off of you the burden of smooth, the burden of efficient, the burden of expedient. I'm asking Jesus to break off of you the fear of a man. In the name of Jesus, you can stand to your feet if you want to. You can lift your hands if you want to. But in the name name of Jesus, I'm breaking this stick as a prophetic act that God, by his grace, is breaking things off of you tonight in Jesus' name.